Hey, it's the Chief Body with Board Games, and we're going to be talking about Brandywine, 1777 Command Post Games, part of their Pub Battles system. The whole Pub Battle system is a map that's kind of like, uh, almost feels like canvas, but on like a photo paper that's, that's going to be plasticized, very durable. Chunky blocks, dice. You can literally play it in a pub. Someone can spill, 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 spill a beer on it and you'd be good to go. They're light. The maps are period piece. I think the maps are gorgeous. Sometimes the maps can lead to gameplay questions that the two players have to suss out between them. That, quite honestly, I think is part of the game. Eight page rule set, um, chunky, durable blocks, and a simple, simple rule set. I may have already said simple three other times. Simple rule set. Let me go in and show you the basis of setup, movement, and combat. And we'll roll back out. I'll give you my thoughts. I should say my catchphrase from the Scott Show, which is we're going to test it. But maybe I shouldn't bring it over. <laughs> See you guys back in a bit. All right, we're in close. You're looking at 1777 Brandywine. So everything you're seeing here comes packaged in the tube. I'm going to pull this off because there's a uh, chit pulling command marker thing, and I use this as my cup. You'll notice, if I can do it without banging stuff, you'll notice the map. I've had it set out, played multiple games on it, but it's still got a little bit of a, of a twist to it. It's a smaller map, but... I may, I have plexiglass that I put on my bigger paper maps. I could see using it on this as well. Uh, I didn't break it out this time just because my plexi is so huge and it causes some glare. I'm going to show you the setup. Um, I'll show you the rules and how short they're eight pages. And then we'll talk about how a turn goes. Uh, Command Post Games lists right on there that the game takes an hour, plays for our 1 to 6. Yep, 1 to 6, ages 12 plus, and it lists the complexity as simple, and I would agree. It's simple, and uh, probably the only contention that can even come from this style of game is the beautiful map and the way you read the territory and some of the simplification yet complexities of maneuvering your units when they're in a line or in this block. But I'll show you that in a little bit. All right, I'm zoomed in tight. Just real quick to show you the chains, kind of like the, the chains from a light bulb where you pull them on, pull them off, the old style. These are what you're going to use to measure movement. Um, and the cavalry is the long one, infantry is the shorter one, and you'll notice the gold sections in the middle. One-third, that's one-third the movement. One-third is a key number sometimes in regards to retreat or moving out of a line column in a road march. Uh, you can't uh, be within one-third the range of a unit that you're getting ready to engage in. A lot of penalties for terrain will be one-third. So they've made it gold in order for you to calculate that one-third movement. Very simple. You're going to have sets of dice for both the British and uh, the Colonials. Uh, you'll be rolling in attacks, we'll get into that, but basically infantry roll three die, cavalry roll two. Um, you have a, a command die, which is all about some chits that I've, they say throw into a cup. I just put it right into the top of the, uh, the tube. Uh, you'll be drawing commander's tokens out of the cup blindly in order to set turn order. We'll explain more of that in a little bit. Let me zoom in on these real quick. These are wooden. I'll grab one real quick before I zoom. So these are just wooden blocks um, that you'll affix the sticker to. And I've obviously stickered them all and been playing. Let me zoom right in. I'll pause. All right, the first thing to note is this is just the commander's uh, cube. So commanders in here do not battle directly. Uh, this is just to show their command influence. They've got to be within one third. That's a key phrase, one third of their army in order to affect orders. Um, a specialty unit can be either this uh, Scottish flag or if you see, whoop, come on, if you see the crown. Also, artillery is this reference here, this little dot, 
And when they're half and half like this, it's a cavalry unit. Just to show some of the documents that come along with the game. So this is showing you setup, which you can see. Shows you that you can set up your British units here, and you're going to pick one of the either center, left, right flanks, and where the Americans are coming in from. So that's one part of the sheet. The other half of the sheet literally shows you all the different units and basically helps you realize how to sticker these units if you didn't know, you know, what unit was British or whatnot. So that's all this is, is a little helper. Um, it also shows you again how the uh, chains work. You then have your terrain effects. So I'll just show you rather than explain, but you can see the one third, one third is a key phrase all the way through. And it'll show you not only the effects on movement, but then the effects on combat. And I'll address some of these quickly when we get into how movement and combat works. Um, road column and such. And then again, you get to see your rates of march for both foot and mounted. The flip side is kind of cool. It has the optional rules, which I'll come back. Multiplayer rules. Well, let me do it now. Multiplayer rules deal with a lot of stuff on limited communications, what you can talk about while you're in, in the middle of uh, playing, um, penalties if you break those, and then the optional hidden rules are rules they suggest, um, and there's some like uh, thicker cardstock that comes with the game where you can have your commanders on the board, uh, but it's just the commanders that are on the map, and their reserves are hidden behind, or your units are hidden behind a blind. And it also allows you to play with um, kind of non-historical, where I can mix the units that I want however I want, rather than staying with the historical accurateness of these are all the guys that were with Cornwallis over here and with Kempf here. So those are the optional rules, the hidden uh, resources and how they come on. They suggest to play that after you learn it. I agree wholeheartedly. And real quick, the rule book. So this is a uh, like slick printed paper, nothing too fancy, but it's color first of all, and it's a total of eight pages. And it is more than sufficient to cover how to play the game. We'll be walking through the turn order. Um, I've already shown you setup. Uh, we'll get into facing a little bit, and I'll also cover how you win. And that's about it. You're really in and playing this game 10, 15 minutes after you getting it stickered. Took me way longer than getting it up and starting to play. All right, first off, just looking at this, I realized I've got this unit all, already crossing the river. I just kind of threw these up when I was going into the setup. And they have to be slightly behind the river for engagement, which is key anyway, because um, in order to come across and engage, um, there has to be one third movement for them to get out of that line march and rotate in. So, I wanted to set that up. I'm sure some people had seen it and thought, man, he's already got that unit coming across Brandywine. All right, the game takes five turns. I'll walk you through one sample turn so you got a feel of it, and then it really just wash and repeat. Uh, the whole uh, idea of the five turns is the battle begins at about 2 p.m., um, and then it ends at 8 p.m. as darkness came in. Um, now, historically, you may know, uh, Washington ends up having to go into retreat, the cavalry and some other units are able to screen, and the British weren't able to really organize and move out um, in the darkness, nor did they have a lot of cavalry, but that's real life. So in this game, you just got to know it goes five turns. Uh, victory is, um, you're get, you get one victory point for each enemy piece that's destroyed, and they're destroyed very simply. We'll get into that when we get into combat. The British also get three victory points if they control a major road. And uh, part of that is there can't be any colonial piece within one-third movement of the road. You're going to continue to hear one-third, one-third on a lot of different things. Um, and the colonials will get one victory point uh, for keeping their losses, their overall losses of all their units um, um, above or no, no more than 50%. The two sides then uh, total those up, subtract from each other. If you have zero... It's a draw. One's a minor victory for whichever side was ahead. Two's moderate. Three plus is major. So I'll walk you through a turn. It's very, very simple. You reach in. 
Oh boy, now my hand's super big. <laughs> Hold on. Uh, okay, so you're going to reach in and you just pull out uh, turn order. I always just, usually I'm the one pulling out. Or if I'm with my son, he's got small hands. Son, go ahead and do it. All right, so you pull out Sullivan. So this would be the colonial unit right up here. You can see my command chip form is there. Here's where the interesting part is. If I don't want Sullivan to go right now, I can come in and actually roll a command die, and all of the commanders in this game are a four. Uh, some of the games will have a number printed on them that tells you, but you're going to want to get four or less, and then I could refuse, so I got a two, I could then refuse that turn order, which is actually key. Sullivan's up there with the idea that wherever, by the way, the British would be coming on, I should have shown it. Um, you write it down on a piece of paper, and let's just say they're coming in from um, over here. All right. So as soon as the British are coming on, I may, well, he may want to move down and already do a blocking turn. So maybe I wouldn't refuse that. Or maybe I want him to go last so that he can try to outflank the British coming on. So I won my roll. I would set this aside for now. It'll go back in the cup in one second. I would draw out another chit, and then I would throw this back in. Now, once I've done that, I've got Howe's name face up now. I actually like to have their gold side up with their names on them so I can see who they are. Um, it looks a little more visual while I'm shooting the video, but it, you're supposed to have it hidden. You flip it up. Hey, he's made a command decision. You can only do one of those in a turn. So if he's drawn again, he will go in that order. Now, there's a flip side of this, too. You could also decide... Um, before one's or as one's pulled and somebody says, hey, Sullivan's going, um, either the Colonials or or the British, or if you're playing a multiplayer game, somebody could say, oh, nope, I want a chance for my commander to go first. You would roll the command die, and if it's four or less, they then get a chance to go first. Here's where it gets a little odd. If I roll and I get the chance to go first, someone else can then try to do the same thing and it can cascade a little bit. Again, you only get to try that maneuver once, so once you flip it over, you've, you can't do it again, so it's not unmanageable, but it allows for some flexibility on command and who's got the initiative and not just totally random, but you can try to force your will a little bit. So that's how the command system works. Next, we'll go in and show how the units actually move. All right, everybody's piece is drawn and you move. And then after that unit moves, you draw another, I said piece, another command shit, they move. All the movement happens in succession, and then units will be in a position where they're going to battle, and then you'll resolve all the battles. So I'm going to zoom in. Um, I'll show you just some real quick, simple movement things, and then I'm going to put some pieces together just to walk through a real simple combat. So when you're in road march, all right, first thing is, these are all infantry units, all right, so we're going to be using the infantry chain. Sullivan, the commander, is within one-third of, of his army, so he can give commands that they, they will then follow. Now, when you're in road or line march, you're actually going to be going three times the length that you're allowed. So these units can really move anywhere they want on the map, almost. Um, just to get a feel for how quickly they move on the road and the difference for when you finally pull them off the road and they're moving at this maximum allowance. So moving across woods, I'm going to take a one-third penalty off, I grabbed the cavalry, a one-third penalty off the chain is for, for my movement to move through the woods. If you move up onto a ridge line, which you can see here, when I first hit the ridge line and then hit the second part of it, it's as if they're climbing really up a steep embankment. So hitting it and then crossing the other side of it is going to cost me one third as well. Um, if I come to an actual bridge, which we don't have here, but you can see uh, any of the on the river marks down below, there's bridges. You're going to pay one-third to move across the bridge, and you can only move across Brandywine 
at the Fords or the bridges, which are clearly marked. Uh, the, um, the swamp, you pay one third and your artillery cannot move through this area at all. And, or the marsh, I should say. You also have a stream coming across here as well. And a stream is also, you pay one third to move across. All right, so he's going to move down and engage the British. I've already put the chain out to show. Remember, he's in road march. This whole unit's in road march, and they're being activated. You can move three times this chain. So you can just see he's going to be able to make it down. So he would be moving down, and when he's um, one-third away from the enemy unit, he has to come out of his road formation and pay a third of his movement cost. And then he's going to center on the roadway. The centering on the roadway is key. One of the factors in combat is your piece and what space it occupies. Make sure I've got the facing right. Yep, that would be the facing. So he hasn't been spent yet. He's centered on the road. And then one third of his piece, again, I would do a probably a little bit better measurement, but you can see one third of his piece, he's not in the forest at all. So he's on open road. Now he'll be able to continue, he's come out of his space, he still has, that was a one-third penalty, he still has movement in order to close in and push the attack, and they're up next to each other. Now, we know again, so here is the normal movement of infantry, but we're in road march, and these guys are all moving at the same time. So again, we have more, that's probably double the length to get down there. Again, I would probably measure this out a little bit closer as we we're playing. Now I have an option, again he has to come out one third away from the combat, and here's where it gets interesting. I can move up in what they call support, which is simply you're in double line and you close up in support, and it allows units to retreat out and other units to engage. Uh, there's a lot of benefits I'll get into when I show support in combat. I'm going to leave that here as now, and I want to see if I can get the other units. So there's one full infantry movement. All right, you can see that would be two on the road march, and I have more than enough, extra actually, that he could have come down. And I can't have three, they never stack on top of each other. But um, we could even try, or I could have tried a forward flanking movement early, but I could pitch this guy up, or I could pitch him down. When you come in, now my movement is back at its normal range of what I have left, and I can move at 45 degree angles. So I don't have enough to sit here and just like walk it all the way around, but when I come out of my one third, I could slide over and do the rest of my, I would have to measure out my movement with the stick, but I could come in and I can adjust my movement by a 45 degree angle. And what I'm getting ready to do is try to set up where I could swing around, and I can't do it on this turn, but if I can get more than half of my block in a position like so, I have a flanking position and I get a bonus in combat. And they get a, a negative when they're trying to fight me. But I can't quite get into that yet. But a big part of the movement in this game is threatening the flanks, which of course is period. That's how a lot of the battles happened. And you can try to muscle units where you want them to be by your threatening positions and your, your attempts to flank. All right, I've zoomed in on the same thing just to show some of the terrain. Now, if my unit is here, you can see he's kind of up on the ridge a little bit. But what you've got to ask yourself is, is more than half of his unit up on this ridge? And no, it's not. The game also asks you to kind of working with your partner say what's really happening here. Well, the unit would have, quite honestly, they would have funneled down through, and you would have to pay your movement costs for moving through the, the woods and whatnot. But in real life, men would have formed, they probably would have gone into rough march, they would have formed through the woods, they would have been forced by this terrain to kind of bottleneck in and they would have come out like so. So when you're, when you're looking at penalties or movement costs or where the unit finally lays, if I was in the woods slightly like this, you would still say, is more than half of his unit in the woods? No. 
is more than half of the unit on the ridge, you've got to make sure it's not. All right, let's just say no. You'd say it's touching it, but it's not. It's more than half of the unit is in the open with no terrain effects at all. All right, I've got the attack set up. Now, the units I have are just regular infantry. Well, sorry, we have one elite infantry unit and then one regular infantry unit. They haven't been spent yet. And here we just have uh, two regular colonials. There is a militia, Armstrong's, I believe, that uh, I'll just probably reference the rules on how they work once I explain this. There are artillery pieces. Artillery pieces can come up and they could be in support. The danger to that is if a regular unit, an infantry or cavalry unit, ever is engaged directly with an artillery unit, the unit's immediately destroyed. However, um, artillery only works in defense. They can bombard um, as well, which I'll show you. All right, real quick to show artillery um, right here. By the way, as soon as uh, there's a line of sight and one unit can see another unit, uh, you just you let the uh, opposing player know what your unit is. So they'll still stay like this because this is a fresh unit. This would be where I would put them if he was spent. All right, spent is dangerous because they're a lot easier to kill. Uh, but the key is artillery can do a couple things. I could have had this artillery unit stand in support. He would be back here. A little bit of a dangerous position. The nice thing about being in support is you would actually, as the defender, and you can only... Um, artillery can only support as a defender. You can't use artillery in the attack, uh, but as a unit in support would be able to fire first against the attacker. Typical roll off and, uh, and they would get a chance to do damage first. Now, if the unit was more in a standoff like this, a position, they have to be within that infantry unit of, of movement or the chain, the smaller chain. It's a little bit further away. That's cavalry. And then their arc of fire is 45 degrees, and instead of movement, they can bombard, which allows them to fire as units are coming in or whatnot. And bombardments cannot destroy pieces. I like that part because back in the day, you were not going to be able to use your artillery to completely wipe out a unit. So you can take them to a spent phase and even make them retreat, but you're not going to be able to kill them. So resolving combat is crazy, crazy simple. Uh, the defender and the attacker, uh, the fire is going to be simultaneous. So you roll off your die. If you're infantry, you're rolling three dice. If you're cavalry, you're rolling two. Infantry and artillery, and I should have artillery in there. Artillery rolls three. Um, you hit on, well, they're both the same. Cavalry, artillery, and infantry, you hit on fours, fives, and sixes. So then you got to factor in your modifiers. If you're in the woods, it's minus one of the attacker's die roll if the defender's in the woods. If you're on a hill and a unit has to attack from a lower elevation to the higher elevation of the hill, the attacker on that gets a minus one. All right, in order to determine a flanking maneuver, you've got to kind of eyeball the center of your piece. If the center of your unit, in this case, this blue colonial unit, is behind the front of the unit it's attacking, it's a flanking maneuver. So if I was to, let me move this over here. All right, so I think the center is probably about right here. I could flank this unit, but I haven't yet flanked this unit. So again, you gotta eyeball it and say, where's the middle of my piece? About here. I've flanked this fella, but I haven't flanked this fella. And this is where, again, when you're playing, you got to take your time a little bit here. And as you move in, there's a little bit of like, okay, I can move 45 degrees. I'm moving. I'm moving into contact. What is the max of my 45 degrees? This can get a little contentious. So I'm just, as you get ready to move into flank, know that the center of your piece and does it fall behind the front lying edge of the unit you're attacking. So I would say here, it does for this one, doesn't for this one. I've got a flanking move here. Because if I now attack this unit in a flanking attack, I get a plus one. All right, so let's say it's just a regular attack. Uh, the way you always go is it's a simultaneous deal. Um, they do have, <laughs> they even have a chart, which I'll break out and show here in a second, that shows 
you may have these units that have come in and so he's attacking him and he's in support and he's in support but then you could literally have like this move come on and flank and then you could even end up with a flank on the other side and as this is going on you're tracking he's the original attacker he's the defender he's then coming in and you're going to roll off in this same order because um, the battles all kind of taking place simultaneously but it matters on if a unit's forced to retreat or not um, to give you an example if you had something like this, which is quite possible, where a unit comes up from another angle and pins in this unit, there will be no retreat here. This, these units can't get out of this. Now, if I was in contact with them like so, so I'm in contact, there's still room for them to wheel and get out and retreat. Um, but you can get pinned, and if you get pinned, you're in a whole lot of trouble. So you roll your die. Again, uh, hits are always four, five, and six. So we'll just walk, oh, kicking, kicking the camera. We'll just walk through. So um, what happens is, is if you take a hit, let me get these support out of here for now. If you take one hit, you're flipped to your spent side. Oh, and I got to cover what uh, the special units do. Elite pieces like this Scottish unit, they will actually absorb the very first hit in a combat. So if there's multiple combats going on, because this will go on and on and on, but we're talking the very first roll, they can absorb one of the hits that's going to come across them. And then there is an Armstrong piece. Yeah, there we go. He's Militia, which you can tell by this M. He's the only one on there. And on their very first hit in combat, they actually get double. So if they roll one hit, that one's going to count as two. You know, maybe they got lucky and they actually got uh, two hits, in which case the very first one's worth two and then three and that, you know, it would be gone. But those are the special pieces that are in and the elite pieces are the British. You're going to have a lot of them. So just know that they can absorb that very first hit. So let's say um, we got uh, Sterling here from New Jersey. He's rolled his dice and he got two hits. So the first hit is ignored, elite piece, first hit in combat, but the second one's going to flip him over to the spent side. Now if he'd received um, two hits, he would have actually had to retreat back one-third away from the combat. You can retreat through friendly units, but you cannot retreat through enemy units. So he would be able to simply move back one-third and fall back to a position like this. I would, I would measure this out. Um, which also means that you can have your support. You can do two things. Your support can come right on up and continue the battle, um, as long as it's not artillery, or that support could retreat back with the unit as well. That's your decision to make at that point in time. Um, so um, if you get a third hit, you're, you're destroyed. So if the unit um, is totally fresh and there's three hits, first one is flip, seconds retreat, but if they were hit three times in that one combat, they're destroyed. Again, make sure you pay attention to these elite units. They're going to absorb one. That round is over. You can have a unit that disengages from combat, but if they disengage, if they move out, if they voluntarily retreat back, they get flipped to their spent side. So it can be a little dangerous to disengage from the combat. But um, a lot of times you'll get into these slug fests where, where it's just you're rolling and then we factor in the next one and the next one and up oh, so-and-so retreats. Well, I want my support to come up. Boom, boom, boom. Somebody gets killed. Or if they're retreated and there's no more combat left, then that one's resolved and you're going to go on to whatever the next fight is on the map. Once you've resolved all the different conflicts that are in place on the map, you then begin turn two, and again, you go through the chit drawing process. Uh, you'll do all your chits, all your movement, and then you resolve your combat again. And it's wash and repeat on that mode, with the big factor being your maneuver and your ability to flank. There's, there's only two artillery pieces in this whole game, so there's not a lot of artillery components, but they do factor in. So... Let me hit what I want to call are my negatives just real quick, get them out of the way, and then we'll spend time on the positives. 
I like the tube for display purposes. It sits on my bar right next to the matching tube of Little Bighorn, and it kind of reminds me of my scotch bottles. I love it for presentation, but I'm not sure I like it for gameplay. I get a weird roll with my map to the point that I think if I play this in the future, I'll bring out plexiglass, but my plexiglass is huge, and this is a small map. I love the details on the map, but the way the edges roll due to it being in the tube, and I've had it sitting out here for maybe a week, and it still isn't fully flattened. Second of all, I wish the map, for my feel, was another 20% bigger. Now, I know that might adjust everything on the size of the blocks and everything, but I felt like things were just a bit more compressed than maybe they needed to be. But I don't want to prejudge it because the pieces fit well and, and you got into contact quickly. And it's a maneuver game, but more of a maneuver to flank, not really a maneuver to contact, which that almost doesn't make sense. But it's not like you're trying to move these armies over miles and miles and miles and then get into position. <clears throat> it's almost tactical movement. I don't know, maybe I'm not explaining that well. I do love the breakdown of the chains, the way you do one third, one third's the theme, take off one third, uh, come out of your road march one third. Um, everything's simple, the, the measuring with the chain devices is perfect. I always love chip pulling. The idea that uh, you can then use your commander that one time to try to either stall your move or move sooner perfect, adds just enough fog of war. The commanders having to be within one third of their units in order to affect orders and, uh, and have them do things means you've got to maintain control and you can't spread out everywhere you would like to be on the map. Means you got to move those behemoth armies around a little bit. Simple, quick, fun war game. Um, a, a little bit of depth in your movement, but it's not... It's not grognard depth. It's more like, how how can I do this? It, get, it can get a little fiddly with some of the terrain, um, but coming in and sliding at your 45 degree angles and everything's, um, it's not quite precise, but if you think of, when, I, when I'm moving a piece, I'm thinking of the men actually as I'm wheeling them into combat. And it all fits very nicely very thematically. Um, I, I love the way you're guarding Brandywine if you're the Colonials and you're pushing into combat and the blindness that you have from the start on where else is the British, where, where, where else is the British? What other area are the British coming from? My left, my right, my center. And the way you are into combat quickly and the game's over within about an hour or less. The dice rolls combat is dirt simple. Um, spent, retreat, eliminated. There's only a couple artillery units in play, so you got to know how bombardment works and if your artillery's in support, but that's like a simple, if you're unsure, you can look it up. You roll off, you roll until that combat's resolved, and then on to the next one and on to the next one. And when they retreat, how far do they retreat? One third away. Easy. Again with the chain. So... It gives you that period piece, that feel um, with all the elite British units and how they can absorb that first hit. You can feel what the Colonials were up against. And in that regard, it really brings home the battle. I'm not an expert on the Revolutionary War. I, I hadn't played, I don't think, any other games with Brandywine. But... Um, this one definitely brought home that that crush, that feel, and the optional rules where you see the commanders moving, but you don't know exactly the units you're involved with. By far, that's the way to play. So the setup just has you learning the game with the presets, but then you can build and separate your armies so they're not a fixed thing that once you know where, where Cornwallis is, you know all the units involved. You can do it historically, but it's for me, it's much more fun to have them Shielded, the reserves are off. You can't see who they are until you can see them visually on the map. Now you've got the full game experience. Get the first game down to get your mechanics, then leave the basics behind and hit the optional rules. 
I mean, there's nothing hard. They give you the pieces to cut out. The units sit on there, you, you know. Uh, but it gives you that fog of war, and this is a game that needs it, in my opinion. It's the Chief, Bonnie with Board Games. This is Brandywine. Beautiful 1777 tube. Beautiful map. Great pieces. At my height, I do have to get down and kind of look at them like this, or I do what I call the 35 40% turnover so I can see what they are. It's like I've got too much of a height advantage going on. That is it. See you guys later. Chief, Bonnie with Board Games. Mm -hmm.